Son Altesse Sérénissime, Albert II. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. His uh, Serene Highness, Prince uh, Albert of Monaco, is going to open this ceremony. Your Highness. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Excellences, distingués invités, distingués participants, chers amis, je me réjouis très vivement que M. Thierry de Montbrial ait choisi Monaco pour la sixième édition de la World Policy Conference qu'il organise et préside avec passion et une implication sans réserve. Cela m'offre l'agréable occasion de présenter à chacune et chacun d'entre vous mes souhaits les plus chaleureux de bienvenue. Notre pensée rejoint toutefois en cet instant la nation sud-africaine qui pleure son père, qui lui exprime aussi par ses chants et ses danses sa gratitude pour avoir fait basculer l'apartheid dans le lointain passé. Ainsi, nous associons-nous à l'hommage rendu à ce juste que fut le président Mandela, homme de paix, de réconciliation et d'unité. Votre conférence Cher Thierry de Montréal, ça signe pour mission à intervalles réguliers de dresser en quelque sorte un état des évolutions qui viennent affecter la gouvernance internationale dans un monde en mutation permanente. Monaco est attentif à la vie des relations internationales en une période où l'interdépendance étant sans cesse accrue, la situation des autres pays nous concerne bien évidemment beaucoup. Dans le même temps, l'information traverse de plus en plus les frontières, souvent en temps réel. Elle nous révèle les attentes des peuples et parfois leurs hésitations sur le chemin de la démocratie. Elle nous révèle aussi que la démocratie ne se décrète pas, mais s'édifie progressivement en fonction de l'histoire de chaque État. I will turn to English. However, this does presuppose a national reconciliation in countries where the state has disintegrated and where a consensus develops around a form of social contract based on a desire to live and work together. Nevertheless, we are seeing an increasing number of trouble spots often occurring simultaneously in many countries where there is a united desire for change. Moreover, these regions of the world are, that, that these regions of the world are undergoing uh, different changes, and these uprisings often have close historical or economic ties to us. The art of diplomacy lies then in providing rapid but not hasty responses, which are proportionate and balanced based on a realistic understanding of the nature and extent of the changes occurring, with a view to supporting change without resorting to intervention and thus helping to ease a smooth transition. Certain states apply this approach and sometimes make it part of a wider intergovernmental framework. Your conference assigns itself an even greater task to contribute to the creation of international governance with the message that economic and social reforms, along with respect for freedom, are guarantees for peace. Under my leadership, the Principality of Monaco plays its part and continues its policy of openness and support at a time when the international climate is marked by the repercussions of the economic and financial crisis, as well as in certain regions of our globe, outbreaks of political and military tension. The spirit of openness is expressed as much by the strengthening of our bilateral relations and uh, multilateral diplomatic relations as by a stated commitment to uh, model policies for environmental protection, sustainable development, and humanitarian cooperation. 
With regard to financial matters, my country, in line with longstanding commitments to the OECD on tax transparency, has signed information exchange agreements with 30 countries. It is also part of the general movement towards joining the OECD's multilateral convention. With regards to international cooperation, my government has maintained its very active policy of focusing on projects for the least developed countries and those with whom our tradition of cooperation goes back very long years and even, uh, even uh, way back in the, uh, the 20th century. A return to fiscal balance will give a new impetus to our official development assistance. President François Hollande's recent state visit to Monaco confirmed the excellent relations between the Principality and France, relations which are rooted in history. At the same time, the Principality is preparing to engage in discussions with the European Union in order to refine its position with a view to resolving certain difficulties caused by development particularly with regards to the exchange of goods and services. As a member of the Council of Europe since 2004, Monaco also supports many of its programs confirming our commitment to standards of human rights, respect for civil liberties, and that of the rule of law with strict respect for our individual requirements. Monaco has 15 ambassadors working with 27 different countries and various international organizations, all contributing to help carry my country's message even further. Along with its consular network, the diplomatic network helps promote Monaco's economy and culture, as well as its attractiveness uh, to tourism uh, to a wider audience. La présence et l'implication de mon pays à l'international permettent aussi de développer la coopération dans le domaine multilatéral au travers du soutien de candidatures, de l'appui de textes et d'actions dans les domaines qui nous tiennent à cœur. Enfin, notre reconnaissance au sein des organisations internationales, manifestée avec éclat, spécialement par la visite officielle de M. Ban Ki-moon, secrétaire général de l'Organisation des Nations Unies à Monaco le 3 avril dernier, pour marquer le 20e anniversaire de l'adhésion de mon pays à l'ONU, atteste également du dynamisme de notre action à l'international. Je mesure aussi, à chacun de mes déplacements à l'étranger, qu'ils soient officiels ou privés, l'intérêt et la curiosité que cite mon pays. En vous souhaitant plein succès dans vos travaux d'échange et de dialogue à l'occasion de cette conférence, Je forme le vœu que vous puissiez goûter à l'hospitalité de la Principauté et apprécier notre ouverture sur le monde. Je vous remercie beaucoup. Maintenant, je vais passer aussi au français, après le long discours que je vais faire en anglais tout à l'heure. En premier lieu, je tiens à remercier Son Altesse Sérénissime, le prince Albert II, de son soutien à notre projet et de nous recevoir dans les meilleures conditions. Je sais qu'un grand nombre de participants à notre conférence, je pourrais dire d'ailleurs de membres de notre club, viennent à Monaco pour la première fois avec aussi le désir de découvrir le rocher et son histoire fascinante. Le destin a failli nous priver de votre présence, Monseigneur, en raison du décès de Nelson Mandela que vous avez évoqué. Ces jours-ci, vos pensées et celles de la princesse Charlène sont en Afrique du Sud. Je voudrais ajouter ma voix aux millions de celles qui ont salué la mémoire du grand homme disparu. Puisse son exemple inspirer des responsables politiques dans d'autres parties du monde déchirés par des conflits qui paraissent insurmontables. 
faute de leaders crédibles et généreux. Je pense particulièrement au Moyen-Orient. Comment ne pas mentionner également l'Afrique, dont nous parlerons dimanche, si pleine de promesses, mais encore marquée par trop d'affrontements meurtriers la mission de la WPC, la World Policy Conference, est de contribuer à l'amélioration de la gouvernance mondiale dans tous ses aspects. Il ne s'agit pas d'un vain mot, car l'accroissement fulgurant de l'interdépendance est une menace autant qu'un bienfait. Bienfait, car l'ouverture maîtrisée est un enrichissement tant sur le plan spirituel que matériel. Menace car la connectivité non maîtrisée multiplie les risques de catastrophe. L'enjeu de la gouvernance mondiale est de maintenir les chances d'un monde raisonnablement ouvert et pour cela d'élaborer des instruments permettant de surmonter les chocs économiques mais aussi politiques de toute nature. Pour cela, il faut s'appuyer sur les structures des Nations unies, que vous avez mentionné aussi, Monseigneur, et comme vient de l'illustrer la négociation dite 5 plus 1 avec l'Iran. Pour l'économie, il faut bâtir autour du G20 encore bien fragile. Peu importe aujourd'hui que le système international soit décrit comme zéro polaire, bipolaire ou multipolaire, le fait est qu'aujourd'hui, les puissances les plus grandes ne veulent ou ne peuvent exercer leur pouvoir. Il est plus constructif, à mon sens, de mettre l'accent sur les puissances moyennes, comme nous y invite la présidente de la Corée du Sud, dont je salue l'envoyé personnel à notre réunion. Par puissance moyenne, il faut, me semble-t-il, entendre toute puissance régionale capable et désireuse d'étendre au bien public mondial au sens large sa conception de l'intérêt national. Cela n'est pas innocent et implique une participation effective au coût de ce bien public mondial. En ce sens, une puissance moyenne au XXIe siècle est l'inverse d'une puissance impériale dans les siècles passés. J'appartiens à un pays qui, sur ce plan, se veut exemplaire. Puisse-t-il, mon pays, se montrer capable de conduire les réformes nécessaires pour soutenir dans la durée cette noble ambition je n'entrerai pas dans le détail du programme de nos travaux dont vous avez pu prendre connaissance. Il couvre la politique autant que l'économie et la finance. En pratique, les deux domaines sont inextricablement liés, aussi bien globalement que régionalement. Je pense par exemple à l'Asie, économiquement prospère et politiquement fragile, au point que certains observateurs y comparent la situation à celle de l'Europe à la veille de 1914. Une importante session de notre conférence devrait nous rassurer sur ce point. Pour cette édition de la WPC, plusieurs sessions seront consacrées au Moyen-Orient. J'aurais aimé pouvoir réunir et faire débattre au moins les principaux acteurs de la région. Sans doute, pareil objectif est-il prématuré, mais je n'y renonce pas pour l'avenir. Même si certains dialogues ne peuvent encore se faire qu'à travers des écrans, il n'en existe pas moins. On me permettra de saluer particulièrement la présence de son Excellence M. Ali Ahani. Je considère personnellement l'élection du président Rouhani et les perspectives qu'elle ouvre comme le miracle politique de l'année 2013. Miracle et pas miracle, puisque le propre d'un miracle est d'être inexpliqué, ou plutôt inexplicable. Chacun en jugera. Son Excellence M. Mohamed Javad Zarif, ministre des Affaires étrangères de la République islamique, a dû renoncer hier à faire le déplacement pour de graves raisons personnelles. Il a tenu à ce que son ambassadeur en France et à Monaco parle ici en son nom. Je me permets d'adresser au ministre tous mes voeux pour lui-même et sa famille. Je tiens aussi à saluer la présence parmi nous demain de son Altesse royale, le prince Turki Al-Faisal, dont la contribution à nos travaux est particulièrement attendue. Parmi les autres sujets que nous allons traiter au cours de ce week-end, j'attire l'attention sur la question des rapports entre politique et religion, avec un S. Comment peut-on envisager l'avenir de cette planète 
si l'on continue de s'y entretuer au nom de Dieu Et comment peut-on appeler à la croyance en Dieu si ceux qui font profession d'en être les serviteurs répandent et attisent la haine Sur un plan plus prosaïque, nous aborderons une question majeure dans la mondialisation, l'avenir de l'ordre juridique en deçà et au-delà du droit international. Nous reviendrons aussi sur le sujet fondamental de la gouvernance du cyberespace, dont il n'est pas exagéré de dire qu'il est à la base de tous les autres. Un aspect de la mondialisation manifestement lié au précédent est la tension entre la tendance au dépassement de l'État-nation au cœur du processus de la construction européenne, dont cette année nous retiendrons surtout le volet social, et la tendance inverse à l'affirmation des identités subnationales, ce qu'au Québec on appelle le souverainisme. J'ai demandé à Mme Pauline Marois, première ministre de la belle province, de nous parler dimanche de cette dialectique. Le temps ne me permet pas de présenter davantage notre programme, et notamment les ateliers, dont je ne doute pas qu'ils auront autant de succès que l'an dernier. Pour conclure, je voudrais simplement revenir sur l'ambition de la WPC, WPC. Notre but est de construire progressivement un club international, européen dans son inspiration originelle, animé par les idées d'empathie, d'ouverture aux autres, je rejoins Monseigneur certains de vos propos, de respect, de réconciliation, je dirais aussi de tolérance, même si j'éprouve finalement quelques réticences pour ce terme un peu condescendant. Nous voulons en tout cas constituer un club à la fois éclairé et influent et sommes convaincus que le monde a besoin d'initiatives de ce genre. La fidélité de nos soutiens, de nos sponsors en particulier, que je remercie chaleureusement, le nombre et la qualité des personnalités rassemblées pour les trois jours qui viennent nous encourage à persévérer et nous en font un devoir. Je vous remercie de votre attention. And now I am going to call Deputy Prime Minister Ali Babajan to join us for his presentation and I hope a small discussion together and with the participants. So, I am not going to introduce in detail uh, Ali Babajan because you have uh, all uh, read uh, about uh, his extraordinary uh, career. Let me just say that he is indeed an extraordinary person. I think, uh, Ali, we have known each other for something like 10 years now, uh, and uh, you have been really one of the pillars Uh, of the AKP uh, government since uh, its uh, inception. You have just now a little few more years. <laughs> uh, you have a very wide experience uh, as uh, Minister of Finance of Foreign Affairs, as the chief negotiator with the European Union. Uh, and uh, also you are a very remarkable diplomat in the strongest uh, sense of the world. So thank you very much for being with us, especially as it was not easy because you are in the middle of a very difficult uh, budget debate in the Grand Assemblée, Great Assembly in, in Ankara. So thank you very much, and it's my pleasure now to give you the floor. Your Sovereign Highness, Prince Albert, Thierry Montpirial, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be here and to have the opportunity to be together with such a distinguished audience. And let me express my sincere appreciation to Thierry Montpirial, who has been organizing this important event for the sixth year in a row right now, which already became an uh, important uh, example of success. This year's World Policy Conference, again, provides a very wide variety of subjects, which will be discussed uh, for two and a half days, political, economic, social issues, and even issues about technology, which are of keen interest 
for all of us. And uh, experts coming from very diverse backgrounds throughout this conference uh, will give their insights for better understanding the current dynamics in the world. Let me talk about the current state of the world economy, uh, which I will talk just a little bit about, and then also a short glimpse about what is going on in Turkey. Then I will be uh, also discussing about how our region is evolving, the region around Turkey is evolving, I would say, and also what we do about our foreign policy issues. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, five years has, have already passed since the beginning of the crisis, and uh, thanks to the extraordinary efforts of the major central banks, the global financial system has returned from the edge of a total collapse. However, we still cannot observe a strong, sustainable, and balanced growth in many of the developed countries. The opportunity window that has been opened for the governments by the central banks should be used in a very careful way for more structural uh, reforms and some growth-friendly fiscal adjustment in many cases. I, it is very important to realize that the central banks alone cannot create miracles, and it is very important for many governments to do the difficult but necessary steps. The Developing countries, on the other hand, now constitute half of the global economy when we calculate it in person power parity terms. Last 10 years for the developing countries versus next 10 years for the developing countries will be somewhat different. The next 10 years, on average, the developing countries will probably have lower growth rates compared to the last 10 years. But still, they will be growing much faster than the developed world. So the share of the developing countries will continue to increase in the global economy. And recently, there is now a new phase in the global economy, which is majorly about normalization of the monetary policies. Many developing countries, and especially those which have high balance uh, of payment problems or high budget deficits, especially have to be very careful for the next several years to come. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, now that the growth is finally happening in the developed world, and also the developing world will continue to grow, from now on it will be very important to concentrate on the quality of growth. Sometimes many countries are so desperate for any kind of growth that we concentrate on the quantity, but actually quality is also very important to follow from now on. And what do we mean by quality of growth? And it could be possible to define the quality by three criteria. Financial sustainability of growth, that's number one. The social sustainability of growth, number two. And environmental sustainability of growth. Let me talk about financial sustainability. The growth happens, but we have to follow very carefully how the balance sheets of the governments are evolving. What's happening with the balance sheet of the financial institutions? What's happening with the balance sheets of the corporations? What's happening with the balance sheet of the households? And of course, what's happening with the balance sheet of the central banks? So if growth is happening at a big cost to the deteriorations of these balance sheets, then the future sustainability of the growth could be really very, very difficult to attain. And the second aspect of quality of growth, social sustainability. The growth is happening, but is the growth creating jobs? Is the growth actually lowering the unemployment, which are two different aspects? The growth is happening, but is it improving the income distribution? Growth is happening, but is it actually reducing the poverty levels in the country? The growth is happening, but is it improving the healthcare system? Is it improving the education system? So if these social concerns are not actually properly adopted into the growth models, then the sustainability of such kind of growth is also going to be questioned. And then the third aspect, environmental sustainability. Is growth happening at the expense of high carbon emissions? Is the growth happening at the cost of depleting water resources, deforestation, 
or climate change. So if that is the case, then the sustainability of growth in the long term is also going to be a huge problem. And it is a big lack of justice between generations. Growing today at the expense of next generation's welfare. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, maybe now a few words about Turkey, what we have been doing and what to expect. Uh, every country has, of course, its own unique dynamics and it's very difficult to compare one country to another uh, in, a, uh, in a perfect way. We have been going through a very important transformation process, a political transformation process, a social transformation process, and also a very important economic transformation process. We have been making many political reforms to improve how our democracy functions, to improve how we implement our practices of human rights and freedoms, rule of law. We have done a lot in these areas, but we have a still a long to-do list in each of these reform areas. Now we have in Turkey more than 400 TV channels, 1,100 radio channels. It became a very open society. In terms of using social media instruments, Turkey is uh, in the top five or top 10 lists of many uh, instruments like Twitter, Facebook, and so forth. It's been also an important economic transformation. We have made very important reforms when it comes to our public financial management and control, our banking system, our social security system, our healthcare reform, uh, which is uh, now quite taken an example by many uh, mid-income countries. Meanwhile, we, are, we were able to reduce our budget deficit. We were able to reduce our public debt. And when the crisis of 2008-2009 hit, we already had a very strong banking system and also very strong public finances. So the impact of the last crisis on our economy has been very, very limited. Confidence has been at the core of our policies. If confidence is there, then consumers continue to spend. If confidence is there, corporations continue to invest. If confidence is there, the banks continue to lend. And in a case where there's lack of confidence, consumers stop, corporations stop, banks stop, and the economy stops. So that's why we put confidence at the core of our economic policies. That was one of the reasons why in 2009, at the peak of the crisis, when many European countries were introducing fiscal stimulus programs, we introduced a fiscal consolidation program. We announced how we are going to reduce our budget deficit even further down and our public debt even further down. And what happened? Since 2009, the average growth of Turkish economy for the last four years has been 6%. The total employment level increased by 6.2 million. That's approximately the size of the jobs lost in the EU during the same period. And our public debt decreased from 45% of GDP to 35% of GDP. So in a way, we demonstrated that growth is possible together with fiscal consolidation. Now Turkey is the 16th largest economy in the world. In terms of agricultural production, we are now number seven in the world. In terms of tourism revenue, in terms of tourism numbers, number of people visiting, we are number six in the world. We were an aid receiving country in 2002 when we stepped in as the government. Now we are an emerging donor nation, billions of dollars spent in many countries which need foreign assistance. Meanwhile, income distribution improved in Turkey. Across OECD, we are one of the few countries where income distribution is improving. We are not just one of them, but we actually have the fastest decreasing Gini coefficient across the OECD countries. The divided we stand report of the OECD reported this uh, a year ago. We have no longer absolute poverty in the country. Even the relative poverty figures have improved dramatically. But on the other hand, we have challenges. We have a high current accounts deficit. We have high dependency on oil and gas imports. We have low saving rates. But we have taken many steps to correct the imbalances in that area, and we will continue to take the necessary fiscal measures, macroprudential measures, and structural reforms to face the challenges in that uh, field as well. Turkey is a country in Asia and also in Europe. Also, we have very close access to Africa. 
We are a country in the Balkans, in the Caucasus, and also in the Middle East. Turkey is a Mediterranean country, a Black Sea country, and also Caspian Sea Basin country. We are a member of NATO, our main alliance axis. We are a member of Council of Europe. We are a member of Organization for Security and Cooperation of Europe. And we are a candidate and also an accession country, a negotiating country for membership to the European Union. We, are, we have a special uh, statue with the Arab League and also Gulf Cooperation Council. We are a strategic partner to the African Union, one of the three standalone countries which have that status. And we have recently become a dialogue partner to the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the first and only country which has that special link with Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which is also a member of NATO. So we pursue an active, multifaceted, and multidimensional foreign policy. We, we, our policies are shaped with a sense of global responsibility. Peace, security, stability, prosperity is always our key themes. We always promote free trade. We always promote market economy, free movement of capital, free movement of goods, free movement of uh, ideas, free movement of energy. Turkey is also now an important energy hub with many, many gas and oil pipelines already existing and uh, on blueprints to help the energy supply security of Europe and many other countries as well. <coughs> European Union has always a very special place in our foreign policy and also for our domestic reform efforts. When we look at the European Union, since 2008 crisis, we are very frequently asked this question, are you still willing to be in? You are doing already well economically, already performing much better than the existing EU members in certain criteria. Some of the new members actually are performing much worse than Turkey by any means. And do you still need the EU? Or why the EU should be still willing to chase Turkey? And as the government of Turkey, the answer to these questions is a very strong yes. First of all, for many of our domestic reform efforts, the European Union has been a key external anchor. The standards, benchmarks, the criteria which the European Union has for the incoming countries is very important for us. Actually, it is a measure of quality of our political reform efforts. Any country can call itself a democratic republic, but how can we actually judge and measure the quality of democracy, which is not an easy case. And for us, the EU has been working as a very important benchmark for many subjects. And we are very happy that the Eurozone crisis is now almost behind us. The rationality, the pragmatism, and solidarity reigned in. We always perceive the EU as a union of values and ideals. Also, we perceive the EU as an important historical peace project after the World War, World, uh, World War II. So when we uh, look at uh, the, the, the common economic benefits that the EU countries are uh, actually uh, holding on together, it is at the basis, at the fundamentals. So these common economic benefits should be there for the strength of the political union to continue. And we have been actually somewhat instrumental in helping uh, with courageous but important policies that the Eurozone has taken uh, over the last several years. TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, is a historical opening. Having the US and the EU, two huge markets merged is very important, especially during a time when pro protectionism, nationalism is on the rise in many parts of the world. This is an important vision, which we are also signing up to by having a parallel process between Turkey and US so that when, whenever the EU-US uh, track is completed, we are going to be completing our own track in a parallel way as a country which is already in the customs union with the European Union. 
Ladies and gentlemen, as I have already uh, described to a certain extent, our political transformation was important for us, but also the reforms that we have made in Turkey became a source of inspiration for many countries in our region. When we proved more and more that Islam, democracy, can coexist, and this can also create good economic outcomes, many people, many young people especially, in our region were encouraged. They were looking for justice, they were looking for freedoms, and Arab awakening started. First with Tunisia, then Libya, Egypt, Yemen, Syria. And each country had its own unique course of change. There are, of course, many challenges. As a former Minister of Foreign Affairs in foreign policy, countries from time to time face with dilemmas. A dilemma between principles, values, and ideals versus national interests. So in many of the cases which we were faced with, we tried to be following principles and values against short-term national interests. In a way, we thought that the long-term credibility is much more important than short-term national interests. And that's how we approached the uh, issues in our region. Syria, a neighbor of Turkey, which is in a very, very difficult situation. 150,000 people already died, women, children, mostly civilians. 6.5 million internally displaced persons, millions of refugees. We are hosting 600,000 in Turkey. And unfortunately, the UN mechanisms, including the Security Council, proved to be totally functionless. And what's happening is that the longer the situation, the problem continues, the extremist groups are gaining strength and they are gaining more support while the international community is not able to deliver. We now welcome the second Geneva conference announced for January 22nd next year. And this is an important opportunity not to be missed. And we are hoping that the full implementation of the first Geneva communique is actually uh, achieved next month. Also, during this conference, the establishment of a transitional governing body with full executive powers and control all, all the government institutions, including armed forces, security services, and intelligence apparatuses is very, very important so that we can have a real independent transitional body to prepare the country for a functioning democratic system. Sovereignty, independence, unity, and territorial integrity of the Syrian state should be reserved in any scenario. And Syria must be a democratic, pluralistic, and respectful country for human rights with rule of law, and every citizen should enjoy full equality before the law, regardless of their religious or ethnic background. And Egypt, the respect for the will of the people and democratization are essential for the stability and economic development of Egypt. Human rights violations undermine Egypt's internal peace and stability. An inclusive and pluralistic political process should help ensure the long-term stability of Egypt. The international community should encourage the interim government to carry out an inclusive process towards the reinstitution of democracy. Iran is one of the key countries in our region and certainly a very important neighbor of Turkey. Turkey's position on the nuclear file has been very clear from the very beginning. We do not want any country in our region which possesses weapons of mass destruction. On the other hand, every country, every sovereign nation should have the right to develop and use nuclear energy for peaceful purposes. We have consistently advocated diplomacy as the only viable way towards a solution on this matter. So we warmly welcome the deal between the P5 plus one and Iran. But we have to keep in mind that the deal is just a first step. The six months ahead is crucial. We hope to see that both sides adhere to the provisions of the agreement, and this will be instrumental to build mutual trust. 
the success in this initial period will pave the way towards a durable and mutually satisfactory solution. Iraq, a country which has a huge potential, a country which has gone through big difficulties over the last decade. And now that the elections are coming up, we hope that the elections of April will prepare a representative parliament for Iraq, a representative government, and also a set of policies by the government which is inclusive and which approaches to every single Iraqi citizen with the same warmness, regardless of the ethnic background or religious orientation. Middle East peace process. It is, and all these challenges to the geostrategic landscape of the Middle East should not distract us from the centrality of the Arab-Israeli conflict for lasting peace and stability in the region. There is now a new window of opportunity, revived peace talks, and there is now a vision of peace with two states existing side by side in peace and security on the basis of relevant UN resolutions and Arab peace initiative. We would like to see settlement of the conflict through the establishment of an independent, sovereign, and contiguous state of Palestine with East Jerusalem as its capital in the pre-1967 borders. On the other hand, we are concerned by the continuing expansion of the illegal settlements. Restrictions on the freedom of movement of people and goods attempts to artificially changing the demographic and multicultural identity of Jerusalem are also a source of concern. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, Turkey's historical and cultural ties with Africa has been instrumental in establishing close relations with the continent. We used to have only 12 embassies four years ago. Now we have 35 embassies in Africa. Our trade is growing very fast. From Istanbul, only Turkish airlines now fly to 38 different cities. Our exports to Africa plus Middle East now almost as large as our exports to the EU. So the economic links are getting much, much closer. Asia, it is by now apparent that the defining theme of the 21st century will be the rise of Asia. This started primarily in the economic field, but political, military, and cultural implications of the rise have gradually started to manifest themselves. While most of the attention is directed towards China, the entire Asia-Pacific region is in the midst of a rapid development process, and consequently, many countries in the region are increasingly seen as important actors. China has become now the second largest economy in the world. The volume of the Indian economy, PPP just, is now almost $5 trillion, and the Asian continent contains around 45% of the world population. And now the growth of Asia contributes 40% of the world growth in terms of GDP, and the growth of trade of Asia contributes one-third of the world uh, trade growth. Despite its rise and immense potential, Asia is also faced with certain challenges. Economy and political choices have had environmental and socioeconomic consequences. So during the coming years, environmental issues will be important to consider. Widening gap between the rich and the poor is something to be addressed. And a healthy social model is urgently needed for many Asian countries. The Trans-Pacific Partnership, on the other hand, like TTIP around the Atlantic, TPP around the Pacific, is going to be also a very important step forward for free trade. Asia-Pacific is also at the center of certain hotspots. Existing conflicts and territorial disputes cause further concern as nationalism is on the rise in the region. Moreover, discriminatory tendencies and increasing violence in some countries have the potential for further conflict. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, there will be very interesting discussions throughout the next two and a half days on most of these subjects and even, even beyond. And fresh thinking will produce new ideas, new uh, opportunities for solutions. And again, my sincere thanks and appreciation to Thierry Montbrial and his team for putting this successful conference six years in a row and hope that this tradition and success continues for many years, if not decades to come. Thank you today.
Well, thank you very much for this uh, very exhaustive uh, review of uh, some of the major subjects we are going to discuss in the next uh, three days. So we have uh, 10 minutes because we have to stop exactly at 3 and 29. Monseigneur, ça va? PM. So uh, let, let me ask you. Um, uh, on um, two related questions. First, how do you see the future of uh, Turkish-Iran uh, relations? And second, uh, related uh, subject, uh, what do you think in realistic terms might be uh, the best uh, outcome for, for, for Syria uh, in the next, let's say, 12 months? Okay. Well, uh, first of all, Turkey and Iran in, in our region are two countries between which the border was fixed in 1639, and it didn't change since then. And in the region, we always had uh, very balanced relations, and I think the, 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 the level of mutual respect has been an important element in, element in our bilateral relations. But also we have been working with Iran very closely in many multilateral settings, including regional organizations that we actually uh, put together, including some other countries as well. Uh, I have already, I think, uh, made clear our position on the nuclear program of Iran, which is evolving, I think, in a, uh, in a much better direction with the new set of uh, negotiations which, which started. Uh, but on the other hand, for some regional issues, sometimes we you know, think differently, and I think it is very natural. But on the other hand, we always keep the political and the diplomatic channels open to discuss everything very openly, like two close uh, neighbors next to each other uh, talking everything very openly and very candidly. And I think that has been an important element of the relations as well. And I think the bilateral relations will uh, continue to be, to be strong and, and balanced. Uh, with, with Syria, uh, next 12 months is very difficult to define. There are many different scenarios. Uh, this the second Geneva conference is a very important chance not to be missed. Uh, but on the other hand, our view has always been very strong about having an, in, uh, having a, a, an intermediary arrangement until the next uh, elections, the new constitution, and so forth, so that the interim government takes the country to a functioning representative democracy. What do we mean by a representative democracy, a democratic system which is inclusive and which has many, many segments of the Syrian population represented in the parliament and in the government? That is, the, the, the we believe, the ideal way to go. But of course, there are uh, other uh, scenarios. There are worse scenarios which could just push things in many, many different directions. But the, but the big threat is that the longer this situation continues, the more number of small groups, uh, extremist groups, actually develop, gain strength, and do more. And that is not dangerous just for Syria, but for our entire region. The national uh, coalition, which is now regarded as the official counterpart of the Arab League, Arab League, when they invite the Syrian government, they no longer invite the regime, but they actually invite the coalition for official meetings of the Arab League. And that is quite a representative, but also heterogeneous group, uh, a group which uh, is very important to stick together and create a viable alternative to the uh, existing regime. So next 12 months will not be easy, no matter what. And this chemical weapons deal it has quite a long calendar, and uh, on one hand it was good because now it is dealt with, but on the other hand, the fact that many countries and the UN is now talking with the regime has given the regime a new source of legitimacy, being a counterpart for these kind of talks. And how to balance this, this out, meanwhile, is also going to be important, I think. Uh, do you think that if the process uh, which has started with the 5 plus 1 negotiation with Iran, if this process continues smoothly, do you think it might help in the solution of the Syrian issue? 
Well, uh, uh, first of all, when we talk about the, the, the nuclear file and P5 plus one in Iran, it is important to keep these talks within the framework of the nuclear file. Uh, there could be countries, I don't want to mention, which could look at the issue at a wider angle, but we think that uh, it's better to keep it concentrated on the, on the nuclear file. And if the goodwill is there, if the sense uh, and the spirit of compromise is there, I think that might, there might be a chance. So that's why it's very important to stick with the calendars, to stick with whatever has been promised mutually, and continue to build mutual trust, which is going to be the key for solutions. So thank you very much. We have time, I suppose, for one good question. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so who would like to ask that one good question? <laughs> If, 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 if not, I'm, I'm, I, I will ask, uh, uh, well, 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 who is, uh, so no candidate for one good question? Well, so yes, I, I, don't, I see the hand, but not the person. Okay, so please identify yourself. François Clemenceau, Le Journal du Dimanche. Um, J'aimerais que vous soyez un tout petit peu plus précis sur votre réponse en ce qui concerne la Syrie. Um, vous avez mentionné qu'effectivement, il ne devait pas y avoir de lien entre la négociation avec l'Iran et ce qui se passe du côté syrien. Malgré tout, vous êtes au courant de ces dernières nouvelles, des derniers jours, à savoir que les groupes extrémistes dont vous venez de parler ont pratiquement dévalisé euh, à la fois les installations et l'arsenal de l'armée libre de Syrie à la frontière turque. Est-ce que ça ne vous pose pas un problème en tant que gouvernement et principal soutien de la coalition syrienne Merci. I am afraid I missed the first part of the question uh, because of the tech. Uh, is it just, is, is just about the stolen weapons is it, is it, or is it another question? I missed the first part. He, he said that you did not fully answer the question on, on, on Syria, but maybe you can reformulate just the début of the question. I got, I got the second half, but not the first half. Je disais que sur euh, ce que vous venez d'aborder hein, en ce qui concerne l'opposition syrienne, vous avez mentionné des petits groupes d'extrémistes qui menaçaient de devenir de plus en plus prépondérants en Syrie et que cela menaçait évidemment l'ensemble de l'échafaudage. De Il se trouve que ces petits groupes d'extrémistes syriens sont devenus maintenant beaucoup plus gros, peut-être qu'on l'imaginait il y a quelques semaines ou quelques mois, et que récemment, ils ont donc à la frontière turque à Babalawa, euh, saisit l'essentiel de ce qui contenait l'infrastructure de l'armée libre de Syrie euh, à l'état-major du général Idriss. Je voulais savoir si cela menaçait ce que vous-même vous avez l'intention de construire avec la coalition nationale syrienne. Merci. Well, I think we should probably more concentrate on why those groups exist and how they find uh, larger and larger grounds in a way. Now, thinking about a country in which half of the population has been internally displaced or living in exile or in, has been living in, as refugees and so forth, and also a regime which is killing its own citizen, 150,000 people already, and then the international community has taken only one step so far, which is to deal with the chemical weapons. Only 1,500 people died because of the chemical weapons which have been verified. But 150,000 people died by other kinds of weapons. And in a country where the international community is not really showing its strength for humanitarian purposes uh, or any kind of viable uh, stance against the regime, then the people, uh, in a way, inevitably, are resorting to these extremist groups which they expect may be doing something for themselves. And this is a very dangerous situation. So that's why we have been always pushing very hard for the UN, for the international community, for other countries, independent countries, to do more about Syria in at much, much earlier phases of the, of the crisis. And how to deal with this is just continue with the, the diplomatic process with Geneva talks, maybe following conferences, uh, with the speed in our mind as a crucial item, as a crucial aspect of 
the, 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 the issue. So if it takes longer and longer, the problems will get bigger and bigger. But also, we should be very careful that the extremists have already means and ways of finding weapons if they want to. I mean, it's, that's not, it's not the, their, their only source of weapons is not the one source where they can just steal from other groups or opposition and so forth. So I think it is a very, very small piece of the uh, big picture which we have to be more and more careful about. Well, it is three minutes, uh, sorry, 29 minutes past three. So we have to stop here. That's quite uh, frustrating, but I hope that this kind of frustration will continue during the meeting. That's better, you know, to stop the session when you would like to continue rather than vice versa. So I want to thank you very much, Ali. Uh, your Serene Highness, I want to thank you very much again for your uh, presence and support. So ladies and gentlemen, please stay here because the next session is going to start immediately. When I say immediately, it is almost immediately. Thank you very much.